Hello there and welcome to this video where we are looking at wired and wireless networks as part of the OCR J276 GCSE computer science specification. So let's get networking. Today we are going to be looking at LANs and WANs, factors that uh, affect network performance, client server and peer-to-peer -peer networks, hardware needed for a LAN, what the internet is and virtual networks as well. So we can see the learning outcomes for here. Um, let's get cracking with what we're doing today. So we have got LANs and WANs. Um, LAN stands for Local Area Network. WAN stands for Wide Area Network. If I draw the LAN that I've got in my house currently, there is my router there. I've then got my PS4. I've got my switch. I've got my PC. Also attached to it, I've got my phone, my wife's phone, um, the tablet she's currently working on, and also the version box. So this is a local area network in itself. Uh, when I'm teaching at school, I will have a router and then I'm not going to draw them all, but you can see the picture. 32 PCs connected to that, which then connects to another part of the network. So this, if we're looking at these as LANs, these are local area networks, which is one in one specific place. A WAN is a group of LANs which are connected together. So for example, if I'm over here and I've got my other friends network here and they've got devices connected to them, if we connected our networks together, we would then have a WAN. If we then put another network over here, we can connect these together and then it joins, put over there, it becomes a WAN. So imagine if this this isn't my house now, if this is Sainsbury's in New Haven, Sainsbury's in Eastbourne, Sainsbury's in Helsham, if they've got one there, I'm not entirely sure, they would be connected by a WAN because Sainsbury's New Haven would have their own LAN, Sainsbury's in Eastbourne would have their own LAN, Sainsbury's in Helsham, if it exists, has their own LAN, and they're joined together by a WAN. A WAN, because it's a wide area network, is normally over a large geographical area. So we're looking not just down the road, we're looking over large areas, sometimes nationally, sometimes internationally. So LAN's local area network, is in a small area, small place, inside a building, whereas WANs is a wide area network, it's a connection of LANs which are connected together. So we've got LANs, we've got WANs. We've got different types of networking hardware here. We've got routers, switches and hubs, network interface cards, wireless receivers and cabling. I'm just going to do a little box around these ones because as a little bit of research for today's lesson, you're going to find out the difference between routers and switches and how hubs work. So that's something else additionally that you're going to need to do. Network interface cards, or as some people refer to them as NICs, um, are used to access an, a network. It could be a physical net, um, network, so for example using a connection media such as cabling, which at which point then you'd have a physical card connected into your PC that you would then attach networking media to. Network interface card could also be wirelessly, um, so obviously there's not going to be a cable connected to it, but then there might be an antenna. Whilst we're talking about wirelessly, we can look at wireless receivers. Um, so these are used to be able to access a wireless signal. So for example, most home hubs, uh, which are used by different ISPs, have got a wireless receiver in them. So then you can connect to um, a network wirelessly. And then finally, we've got cabling. Cabling is really, really important when creating an, a network, because if you're not um, going to be able to create a wireless network, you're going to need to use cable. We've got different types of cabling available. We've got fiber optic which is super, super fast, uses light to be able to send the data, like you can see fiber optic Christmas trees, but it is crazily expensive. But you also get extremely, extremely good speeds when using them. Or you've got your standard RJ45 Ethernet connections, um, which you see around the house. You get free cabling when you buy, um, buy a PC or when you get a games console delivered. They're cheap, they're standard, but with an RJ45 connection, you've only got a limited amount of space to be able to spend in data because then the signal degrades and you lose the information. Doesn't happen as often with fiber optic. So remember, um, as part of this activity, you need to be looking at the different sorts of hardware, the three topics that I've given you to do some research on, and then we've got some questions there that you need to be answering. So pause the video and then we'll move on. So now we're gonna be looking at five different network performance issues. First one we are going to be looking at is bandwidth. What bandwidth is, is the amount of data that can be sent or can be received 
uh, using a particular connection. So for example, if you've got an internet connection which has got a bandwidth of 5 megabytes a second, you're only going to be receiving 5 megabytes a second. My broadband connection speed at home assures me that I can get up to 87 megabytes a connection, 87 megabytes a second connection, but then if I've got bandwidth issues, so for example if I've been naughty and downloading um, movies illegally, which hand on heart I would never do, um, the, my ISP, my internet service provider, can throttle my bandwidth so it slows it down so it's not as fast as normal. We have then got latency. Uh, gamers um, who game online, uh, mainly during PCs, because that's the easiest way you can probably see it. Um, their latency shows up, and that is the delay between you sending information from your PC and it being received by a server, normally measured in milliseconds. So you want a lower latency as possible. So for example, when I'm raiding in World of Warcraft, I make sure that there's nothing else using the internet connection at all. So my wife's not using Netflix and that she's not downloading anything on her phone because I want to make sure my latency is as small as possible so I've got that fastest connection to the server. When you're thinking about someone who's gaming, if they've got a larger latency, if they've got a larger delay between receiving, the, sending and receiving the information from the server, that means that something could go wrong in the game and they're not going to have as quick of reflexes. When we're thinking about latency, think about it as human reflexes. If you see a ball coming at you, you're going to catch it straight away because your brain's not got that much of a slow latency. Whereas if you've got a latency of a second, by the time someone's throwing a tennis ball at you and you're t you're, you've processed for a second to see what's going on, nine times out of ten, it's probably hit you straight in the face. When we're thinking about error rates, strangely enough, the clue is in the name uh, is the amount of errors for being sent and received on the network. So if you've got an old router or an old switch that can result in um, traffic not being sent correctly or efficiently, that can increase the error rate. Another not often thought of network performance issue, especially when we're thinking about wireless or if you receive your TV from Sky TV, is the local weather conditions in the area. So I live in New Haven, which is famously, maybe, um, in a bit of a valley. So if there is bad weather, if there's a bad storm happening, then people's Sky TV connections can falter because they're just not ready for this. And it's disrupting the conditions, which then means that it can't get a clear signal through. Similarly, if it's a cloudy day or if it's a windy day and the signals are being sent down from a satellite, again, local weather conditions can play a part in it. The final one we're looking at is network congestion. So I'm eagerly anticipating the birth of my child. At the moment, it's just me and my wife living in my house. But then soon we're going to have a child. And then maybe one day he or she will turn out to be a pro gamer. So we're going to have more devices on our network. So if we've got loads of different devices all at the same time. So if I'm on my PS4, my wife's on hers and my child to be on theirs. All these pieces of hardware at the moment are trying to use the same piece of network technology and all trying to use the same sort of network infrastructure so there's congestion. Just like cars at rush hour, lots of cars on the road, things slow down. Same thing again, loads of traffic inside a network, the traffic itself slows down. So what I want you to do is show me your network performance issues knowledge. What are different network performance issues? How do they occur? How can they be mitigated? Have a think. How can certain things be prevented? And if we're thinking about the weather conditions, please don't write down, we can be magician and stop storms. Because unfortunately, that won't be as an acceptable answer in your exam mark scheme. So give the video a quick pause, and then we'll carry on. So now we're going to look at two particular types of network. The first network type we're looking at is client server. So here we have got the server and this is going to be everyone's favorite game, FIFA. And then there's my PlayStation and some other people's PlayStations over here. And we all play online. We all connect to the same server online and we get the information back. So when I log on to the EA servers, I'm sending them information. This is my login information. I want to see who's on my FIFA team they then send me the information back. So with a client server network, all the information is sent or received. And we've got this one central server here. So for example, when we're playing FIFA online, we're using the FIFA servers. When I'm playing farming simulator online, using the farming simulator servers. This is good because if FIFA do any updates or if they do any new transfer packs, they've only got to update on their end, this server here, and then it sends out all the updates everywhere else. If we need to make a change here, it's only changing here, and then it's not 
they don't have to update every single PlayStation around the world. However, if the makers of FIFA go bankrupt and this server goes down, no more FIFA online. So we've got a client server network. The clients connect to the servers and then the servers sometimes provide some sort of, sort of purpose. And again, if we think back to what we we're looking at previously, if on Christmas Day there are 3 million people who have bought a new game, they're all trying to connect at the same time, we're going to see Mr. Sadface again because we've got one server, everyone trying to connect to it, we've got network disruption going on. So a client server networks, there's a central server which hosts things which people connect to. So for example, when I'm at school, we use a program called Sims for taking the register. There is one Sim server, which then all the teacher desktops connect to. So this has got a copy of the database on it. So then there's not a copy of the Sims database on individual teacher computers, because that would be a massive uh, GDPR issue. But then if something needs to get updated on Sims or they need to update the database on Sims or add a new function, they do that again on the server and then things can be updated. Again, because we've got this one source here of getting information, getting updates from, secure, security rise, it is really good because everything is connected centrally. But then we can think about peer-to-peer -peer networks. And a peer-to-peer -peer network is not the same at all to a client server. So peer-to-peer -peer networks, you might have heard them for legal file sharing, is when a network is built by connecting to other people's devices. You may not know who they are, they might have a file that you want, and as you can see, they can be added and connected to in a completely ad hoc manner. So although these sorts of networks are good if you know where to be looking for information, they are used quite commonly for illegal file sharing because if I'm looking, not that I would because that's illegal, if I was looking for the latest farming simulator game and all these people here, if that's me, um, all these people have got copies of farming simulator installed in their PCs, I might say, right, can I have a particular piece of information from you, particular information from you, from you and from you, I can then use using a peer-to-peer -peer network access these devices here to be able to get my farming simulator um, download. I can people can also add and connect to other people's PCs as and when they want. If we're thinking about security, not very secure because if you've got Dodgy Dave over here connecting to this machine here and he sends over a virus, it is then going to spread to these three and then it's going to spread some more because with a peer-to-peer -peer network it's quite easy to connect to with the peer-to-peer -peer network viruses can spread around really quickly similarly if I'm trying to connect to this device here and see what's on there just like a door they can look back and see what I'm doing as well so with the peer-to-peer -peer network there are advantages of it there are definitely uses for it but there are some downsides specifically for thinking about security so what I want you to do now look at client server and peer-to-peer -peer networks benefits and limitations, you know the drill by now. So give the video a quick pause and then we'll carry on. If we are now thinking about the internet itself, so the internet is what is called a network of computers. Can remember when you look at earlier, we've got my LAN here, other people's LANs all over the place. They are all connected together. So all these are devices that are connected together to create the internet. An internet is a large WAN. It's a sort of large WAN, remember, is a group of LANs connected together. So it's one big happy family, all these devices connected together. We can also refer to the internet as the cloud, which then allows you to use other people's information, other people's services as well. There's advantages. Sometimes it's free, sometimes it's quicker to do, but there are disadvantages as well. So for example, if you're on holiday and you want to access what's in the cloud and you've not got an internet connection, you're not going to be able to. So think about what the internet is. It is a group of network. It is a group of servers. It is a group of things that talk to each other. Why is the internet needed, boys and girls? That's another thing to be thinking about as well. So give the video a quick pause. And as you can see, we're now going to be looking at virtual networks. So virtual networks, as the clue is in the name, virtual um, it is a network which is run by uh, pieces of software. 
So if we've got here on the left hand side a traditional local area network, we've got one hub, two hub, three hub, and each hub has got a series of devices connected to it. Over here, we've got exactly the same setup with different computers attached to a piece of hardware. So here we've got something which is physical, here we've got something that's virtual. And the main difference is this is ran particularly maybe on one server. So you've got one server which is virtually hosting all these machines. So for example, when I need to connect to something at work, I can connect to a virtual um, desktop environment which is run on a virtual PC, which is connected to a virtual server, which is part of a whole group of other virtual servers, which is then ran by one physical server. So if we're thinking about this, it is quicker, it is easier to do, it is easier to set up rather than having a physical equipment like we've got over here. We need to set up cables, we need to set up cabling itself, we need to make sure everything is working in tickety-boo. Whereas with a virtual network, it sorts itself out in some regards and it's quicker and it's easier to do. If you want to be doing a whole group of researches on different areas, do you want to go to the expense of having to have the physical expense as well of having areas to work for different things? Or we can just run things virtually through a server and see what happens, do some research. So, last thing I want you to be doing is looking at what virtual networks are, who are they using and why, and what are the benefits of using a virtual network. I hope this video has been helpful for you and I shall see you in another lesson. See you later.